let's start with some goals uh, for today. Uh, we'll cover some resources for identifying weeds, but our main focus will be to learn how to identify some of the most common lawn and garden weeds for Illinois primarily. Uh, a handout will be provided that has a short description of each weed. Um, and uh, I'd like you to note, though, that I will not be closely following the handout. Uh, it might be easier just to refer to that as a refresher after the publication or after the uh, the presentation, rather. Um, and so people typically ask, um, what is this weed and how do I control it? Uh, proper identification is key for controlling weeds. So you know for sure what you were dealing with. Um, and you can then determine what the best approach is and the right time of year to tackle it. Uh, to make identification easier, you'll want to start with healthy weeds and good lighting uh, so you can more easily see the plant structures and leaf arrangement. Uh, a hand lens can greatly assist, um, but in a pinch, you can use your cell phone camera to zoom in on the small areas. Often to make the final determination in weed ID, we need to see the flowers. So sometimes we have to wait for those to develop first. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not have time today for a detailed weed ID of everything that you could encounter, uh, as that could be a semester long class or, or even more. Uh, so instead, we'll just cover some basics of weed ID and some of the more commonly found weed species. Uh, there are certainly others I would have liked to include, uh, but we are really limited by time. So what is a weed? Uh, a weed is a plant that is growing out of place, and it's not so much what the plant is, it's where the plant is. Uh, desirable plants can become weeds when they spread into areas where they're not wanted. Uh, also, one person's weed may be another person's flower. Violet is the state flower, but many don't want it in their lawns. I allow it in certain beds, but not in others, because it will take over. Asiatic day flower has a nice true blue flower, uh, but it can be aggressive. Morning glory is a vine that can be attractive in the right place, um, but it is a heavy seed producer, so after it goes to flower, you'll have it for years. Uh, so it depends on where the plant is growing, how it is affecting the intended use of the area, and who is looking at it as to whether it is a weed or not. So what makes a weed a weed? Maybe it interferes with the intended use of an area or it appears unsightly. Weeds can really detract from the appearance of a site. They offer unwanted competition for nutrients, water, light, and space. In fact, they can be very invasive, taking all the space they can. Weeds can harbor insect and disease pests too. Also, uh, they can be a fire or health hazard. Many are allergic to ragweed pollen. Uh, many are susceptible to the rash that poison ivy can cause. So many know these weeds already, but may be less familiar with the other two species shown here. Uh, these are found across the state, often growing together. Poison hemlock is highly toxic if ingested. Uh, wild parsnip contains a sap that can cause painful blistering once your skin is exposed to sunlight. Uh, so cover your skin if you must physically handle this plant. Once someone determines they have a problem weed, their next thought is usually, how do I control it? Uh, the first step should always be to properly identify the species. This is so important because not all herbicides or weed killers are created to control all weeds equally. Many times poor control results because the wrong type of herbicide uh, was used based on improper species ID. Uh, scout landscapes. Take a close up look at your lawn and gardens and see what problem weeds you have. Get a good weed ID book for reference, uh, such as the one pictured here. Weeds of the Northeast is an excellent book and it's available in most large bookstores. Uh, there are others uh, that I'll show you at the end. Uh, of course, uh, there are several plant ID apps available. 
Um, but a good reference will help you uh, certainly uh, determine the, the life cycle and favorable growing conditions of your weed. Um, maybe you can make some adjustments, you know, to the growing conditions so that they're less favorable. Uh, for example, core aerification can be used to alleviate compaction and problems with weeds that thrive in these conditions, uh, such as goosegrass or knotweed. Adjustments may also be made to lighting and soil drainage. Um, knowing the life cycle can help you determine just how serious the problem is likely to get and also what the most appropriate method of control is. Um, also, this can help you obtain better control through herbicide selection and application timing. Consult with the Home Yard and Garden newsletter website. Uh, you can search for articles about your pest. Um, the guidebook Pest Management for the Home Landscape is published and revised periodically by University of Illinois Pest Control Specialists and is available for sale through your local extension office. Uh, apply controls take notes, um, certainly notes of, of what weeds you had where, uh, what controls you used and when you use them, uh, give your control efforts time to work, and then evaluate the quality of control. Uh, record this in your notes as well. And then lastly, uh, read and follow pesticide labels carefully. It's the law. Uh, be sure all species are included on the label, use the label right, more is not better. Uh, wear the proper equipment and clothing so that you are protected from exposure. We could spend a lot of time talking about control, uh, but the focus of this presentation is identification. Uh, to simplify matters, we'll focus on the two major types of grasses and broadleaves. Uh, if your weed is a grass, these top three things are important. Look at the collar region of the leaf. Pull back a blade and you'll see that the collar that rests next to the stem. Here you'll find the ligule, a projection at the base of the leaf blade. Is it a line of hair or is it membranous where it's thin and almost transparent? Is the ligule very tall and, and prominent uh, or is it very short? Uh, hold it up to the light or use a magnifier uh, to help you see. Are auricles present? These are small finger-like structures that clasp the stem at the collar. Uh, these are absent on most grassy weeds. Uh, however, a quackgrass has long prominent auricles that often clasp each other. Look at the shape of the stem and roll it between your thumb and first finger. Is it round because the leaf blades are rolled in the bud? or flat because the leaf blades are folded in the bud. Nodes, uh, sometimes the nodes are swollen, giving the stem a, a zigzag appearance like we see uh, here on crabgrass. Look for hair everywhere, top and bottom of the leaf, along the stem. Uh, look at the seed head, note the type or shape and color. In fact, note the color overall of the entire plant. Grasses can range from yellow-green to blue-green to some reds, too. Lastly, check for the presence of rhizomes and stolons. Don't be afraid to dig plants up to look. Uh, both types of runners help the plant to spread, and they can be helpful with ID. Uh, so these are some of the major things to look at when identifying grasses. If your weed is a broadleaf weed, Take a look at the cotyledons and leaves. What is their shape? How are they arranged on the stem? Is it opposite, alternate, or world? Are the leaves attached to the stems by petioles? Ground ivy, shown here, has leaves that are opposite each other in pairs, attached with a petiole. Look for waxiness and hair. Check both sides of the leaf stems, too. Um, what do the, the flowers look like? Um, what about the fruit, seed capsules, the seed? Uh, and finally, dig up the roots. Are they fibrous or is it a tap root? So let's talk about life cycles quickly before we discuss how to identify some of our more common weed species. Uh, examples of each will be shown with pictures. 
Um, there are three major types. Uh, annuals complete their life cycle within one year. They reproduce by seed only. There are two types. Uh, summer annuals germinate in the spring. They flower in the summer and they set seed in late summer or fall. Now, winter annuals germinate in the fall. Then they flower and set seed in spring or early summer. Biennials, like annuals, reproduce by seed only. Uh, however, they have a two-year life cycle. Bi meaning two, uh, annual meaning one. Uh, they are broad leaves, not grasses. Uh, the first year when it's warm, they, they germinate and form a rosette of leaves that lies flat on the soil. Then the second year, they bolt, flower, and set seed. Perennials can live multiple seasons uh, and flower more than once. They can begin from a seed or from vegetative structures such as rhizomes, stolons, tubers, or bulbs. Uh, perennials all have some sort of vegetative structure that helps them to survive year uh, to, to year, um, such as the uh, taproot of a dandelion or an underground stem, such as a rhizome, as you would find in Canada thistle, or a tuber in yellow nutsedge. Perennials can be very difficult to control uh, and may require herbicide for complete control. Annuals will be the easiest to control, and no matter the life cycle, the seedling stage is the best and easiest time to control them. So let's look at some specific weeds. Uh, we'll start with the annual grasses. Crabgrass is a tillering grass that grows prostrate and forms a flat, sprawling mat. Uh, plants are typically pale blue-green, uh, but may have red or purple lower stems. The leaf blades are fairly wide. Uh, crabgrass leaves are very hairy, top and bottom. The ligule, however, is not hairy, but instead membranous. Uh, crabgrass is one of the first warm season annuals to uh, germinate, typically when the top quarter inch of the soil has been at 60 degrees Fahrenheit for seven to 10 consecutive days. Uh, so this occurs typically in mid to late April for central Illinois, uh, two weeks earlier in the south and two weeks later in the north. Uh, it's not uncommon to see some germination even earlier uh, if site conditions are warm. Uh, and if there's ample moisture, crabgrass will germinate well into the fall. Crabgrass seedlings are typically a light bright green with fairly wide leaves and stiff hairs at a 90 degree angle from the stem. Uh, frost will kill this summer annual plant and leave brown spots behind as you see in the top middle picture. Um, seed is the primary means of spread for crabgrass. Uh, the flowers are born in a raceme with three to 13 purplish, finger-like spikes. Goosegrass, it's a summer annual uh, that germinates after crabgrass by about two weeks as it needs higher soil temperatures. It is a coarse bunch type grass with a silver or white flat center. The leaves are dark green and folded in the bud. The collar is broad, and sparsely hairy, uh, the ligule is membranous. Goosegrass survives well in compacted soil um, because its roots, its roots are um, more tolerant of low oxygen levels than the roots of our cool season turf grasses are. Uh, goosegrass is often found next to sidewalks or driveways uh, where the traffic has spilled over. Core aerification can be used to alleviate compaction uh, so that turf grass species are, are better able to grow and compete with this weed. The flowers are finger like spikes, and each spikelet seed head is zipper like with two rows of seeds. 
foxtail. Uh, foxtail is a clump forming erect summer annual with a bristly foxtail like drooping seed head. Uh, really, it doesn't look too dissimilar to some of our ornamental grasses. Uh, this grassy weed is maybe more of a problem in cultivated sites, but it can be found in lawns too. Common types of foxtail include giant, yellow, and green. In giant foxtail, the top of the leaf surface is hairy with short hairs. The ligule is a fringe of hairs. Uh, when mature, giant foxtail can grow three to seven feet tall. Green foxtail and yellow foxtail are similar species, but there are differences in the hairiness of the leaves and also the color and length of the seed heads. Um, also, these two tend to be smaller overall than giant foxtail. Yellow foxtail is similar, uh, but with characteristic long wispy hairs at the base of the leaf. The stems tend to be a little flattened, uh, even though they're rolled in the bud, and the lower stems are often reddish. The seed heads are more of a yellow. Green foxtail leaves lack hair, but are rough and sticky feeling. Uh, if you slide a leaf between your fingers, uh, you'll feel that stickiness. The, uh, the seed heads of green foxtail are green and smaller than the other two species. Barnyard grass is another clump forming summer annual. It grows coarse uh, and erect up to four feet. Uh, the roots are fairly shallow. The seed head is a coarsely branched green to purplish panicle. A fairly unique characteristic about this grass is that it has no ligule and the collar is smooth. Uh, see the white upside down V in the middle top picture. Uh, also, the leaves are hairless and smooth. There are three perennial uh, grassy weeds and one grass-like weed uh, that's common to lawns and gardens. Uh, the first one we'll discuss is nimble will. Nimble will is a warm season perennial, so it grows actively in the middle of summer when temperatures are hot. Uh, it likes wet, shaded areas, but will tolerate full sun, and it's commonly seen in central Illinois, especially in older neighborhoods uh, with an abundance of shade trees. It creeps by stolons, and it will form dense patches. It can be a problem weed in cool season turf uh, because it goes dormant earlier. Uh, and it will leave behind light brown patches that fade to off-white in the winter. Uh, by spring, plants look ragged. Uh, nimble will also has delayed growth in spring, so it's really noticeable when the surrounding turf grass first greens up. The ligule is membranous. Uh, nimble will is grayish to bluish green when actively growing, uh, but new growth can be lighter green. The leaves are short and flat and extend 90 degrees from the stem. The flower stalks shown here on the top right are long and slender and uh, they appear in late summer. Spread is by seeds and by stolons. Tall fescue, shown here on the right. Uh, it is a coarse textured, cool season perennial uh, grown as turf in many areas uh, because it has good heat and drought tolerance. Uh, however, uh, when growing alongside other finer textured desirable species uh, such as Kentucky bluegrass or perennial ryegrass, it is often considered a weed. Uh, tall fescue is a, it's a clumpy bunch type grass. It also has wider leaf blades uh, and often grows faster and taller than other turf species, uh, thus making it quite noticeable. And even when mowed, uh, the clumps are still visible as the, uh, the lower stems are often light in color. The leaves of tall fescue are flat, 
thick and dark green with distinctive veins. The collar region is whitish and broad uh, with short, blunt auricles. Uh, the flowers are panicles growing up to 12 inches long. Quack grass, uh, it's a cool season, aggressive perennial um, with active growth in the spring and the fall. Uh, it's often dormant in the heat of July and August. It is a coarse textured grass with wide blue-green leaves. It forms patches uh, in thin droughty lawns and, and gardens and, and will take over if you stop waiting long enough for a bathroom break. Um, interestingly, another name for this is devil's grass. If you suspect a grass is quackgrass, look for prominent clasping auricles. These finger-like structures at the base of the leaf are a key identifying feature for quackgrass. Um, when young, quackgrass can have hairy stems as shown here on the right. When it gets older, it loses its hair. Uh, perhaps some of you can relate. Um, older growth will have smooth stems. Uh, the flowers are narrow, dense and occur in terminal spikes two to six inches long, appearing in late May to September. Quackgrass spreads by seed and rhizomes, which can be several feet long. Uh, they are wiry, sharp tipped, and light colored. Uh, the rhizomes have rings of roots at the nodes. Uh, and this is my dog's favorite weedy snack. Uh, the rhizomes can be chewed like licorice and taste like sweet celery to me. Yellow nut sedge uh, closely resembles grass with its narrow leaves. Uh, however, a, a well-trained eye can easily spot differences. Uh, this warm season perennial has yellow, green, waxy, even shiny leaves that are smooth, hairless, and long. Uh, each leaf has a distinct midrib, uh, which is where the leaf was folded in the bud. Yellow nutsedge has a triangular stem that is most distinctly triangular at the base of the plant. Uh, however, um, you know, grasses have round or rounded stems. Um, the rhyme, sedges have edges, can be used to remember. Uh, the leaves originate from the base of the plant in groups of three. Yellow nut sedge can reproduce by seed, but will primarily uh, spread by scaly rhizomes and tubers. Uh, the tubers are commonly referred to as nutlets. Uh, these develop underground, usually six to eight weeks after emergence, and can remain dormant uh, there in the soil for many years, just waiting for proper environmental conditions before further developing into a new plant. Uh, note the nutlets in the bottom right and center pictures. Um, flowers appear in late summer. They are yellow to golden brown spikelets with leaf-like bracts directly beneath them. And the flowers are at the top of stout stems. It's best to control yellow nut sedge when it's in the seedling stage. Uh, so before underground uh, reproductive structures develop, which is typically in July and August. Uh, plants pull easily in moist soil. Uh, control tactics should be employed typically before 4th of July, um, you know, generally to help ensure good control um, and, and, you know, and realize that many grass killers will not kill this weed. Um, I got lucky when I was able to remove these plants from the soil. Uh, note that they're all connected by rhizomes and nutlets are present. Now the rhizomes and nutlets can break off uh, pretty easily and remain there in the soil. Uh, yellow nut sedge prefers wet soils, but can tolerate dry sites. Um, improving drainage can help in the long run um, with this weed. Now let's take a look at a few common broadleaf weeds that are annuals. Common lamb's quarters 
is a summer annual and member of the goosefoot family. It grows erect and branching with a short branched taproot. Um, however, it will tolerate mowing or trimming and become prostrate in form. Uh, the leaves are alternate and irregularly toothed. Uh, the seed leaves, called cotyledons, are long and narrow. Uh, they're very fragile and can be tinged with maroon. Uh, it's not uncommon to see maroon on the stem uh, or the petioles. Uh, but the big identifier for this plant is the gray mealy coating on the leaves called bloom. Uh, the flowers uh, shown in the top right are small, green, uh, and inconspicuous, um, but they're produced on spikes, uh, which form a panicle. Uh, because one plant can produce thousands of seeds, you'll want to control this one early or you will have it for years to come. Velvet leaf is a member of the mallow family. Uh, it grows erect, usually unbranched uh, and tall, uh, with a shallow taproot. The leaves are alternate and they're heart-shaped. Uh, both the stems and the leaves are softly hairy and emit an unpleasant odor <laughs> when touched. Um, the flowers have five yellow petals and the seed capsule is distinct. Uh, in the old days, women pressed these into their butter to make a pretty pattern, hence the nickname butter print. Uh, because the seed can remain viable in the soil for 50 years, yes 50, uh, this is another you'll want to control early before it goes to seed. Common purslane is another summer annual, um, but unlike the broadleaf weeds so far, this one grows prostrate or low to the ground. Uh, the leaves and stems are reddish, thick and succulent. The roots are fibrous and plants pull out easily. Uh, the stems will reroot easily, uh, so don't leave plant fragments lying after weeding or you will be weeding again shortly. Also, do not use tillage as a control method or you will increase the common purslane population. Uh, the, the flowers are small, uh, they're yellow with five petals. The fruit is a globular capsule uh, that splits at the middle. Common purslane thrives in hot, dry conditions uh, like sunny spots and tight crevices. Handbit, is a, it's a cool season annual. Uh, it's most noticeable in the spring when in full bloom and covering the fields. Flowering can sometimes occur in the fall, too. Uh, Hembit prefers fertile, moist soils. Hembit is a mint with square stems. Uh, it's low growing, but uh, the stems are usually upright. Uh, the leaves are prominently veined and crinkled. They're arranged two different ways on the stem. The lower leaves have a rounded toothed margin and attach to the stem with a petiole. The upper leaves are deeply lobed and they're borne directly on the stem, so there's no petiole. Uh, the flowers are pink to purple. They appear to have two lips like an open mouth and they are tubular shaped. Uh, they're born in whorls in the upper leaf axils. Prostrate knotweed. Uh, this is a persistent summer annual uh, with a thin taproot. Uh, it grows well in lowly fertile, compacted soils uh, and can be found in sunny areas and thin turf. One plant can form a mat up to two feet across. Um, mature stems are tough, they're wiry. Uh, it's easily confused with prostrate spurge, um, but spurges have milky sap and uh, the leaves are oppositely 
arranged. Now knotweed's new growth looks more lush. The leaves are bluish green, small, oval, dull, and alternately arranged. Uh, the leaves can sometimes look grayish green if infested with powdery mildew. Uh, late in the year, especially with the onset of cooler temperatures, plants will often have a, a red or purple coloring. Now this white band encircling the stem is a papery sheath called an ochrea um, that encloses the stem uh, there at the nodes. Uh, this structure is characteristic of the buckwheat family of which it's a member. Uh, prostrate knotweed germinates very early in the spring and then flowers in the summer. Uh, the flowers are tiny, white to pink, and appear at the junction uh, of the leaf and the stem. This plant is an indicator of compacted soils and is often found next to sidewalks and paths where the traffic commonly spills over. The newest growth uh, can be confused uh, with that of grass as the cotyledons are very narrow, uh, but it's not grass, it's not weed. Common chickweed is a winter annual that is uh, primarily a weed of lawns and landscaped areas. Uh, the leaves are opposite, egg to teardrop shaped, and typically bright green in color. Common chickweed produces flowers in the spring. Uh, they're white with five deeply notched petals, which gives the appearance of 10 petals. Uh, the stems are softly hairy and can reach up to 15 inches. They can droop, creep, and root at the nodes. Common chickweed is low growing and can form large, dense patches in cool, moist shade. Uh, if protected from heat and drought, this weed can persist long into summer. Uh, with the summer heat of June and July, this weed can be found reaching across other plants, uh, turning yellow and dying back. Um, many seeds, of course, are, are left behind to germinate once the cool temperatures return. Now let's take a look at a few common broadleaf weeds that are perennials. Mouse ear chickweed. It's a cool season perennial that closely resembles common chickweed in growth habit. Uh, however, the leaves are dark green. Uh, they're oblong and they're densely covered with hairs. Uh, common chickweed, as you recall, is not hairy. Ground ivy is also known as Creeping Charlie. Uh, this cool season perennial uh, occurs in shaded sites with poor drainage, uh, but can spread into sunny areas. It forms patches. Amazingly, it can be found for sale as a ground cover, and it is fantastic at it. Ground ivy is in the mint family. As such, it has square-shaped stems and will emit an odor when crushed. The leaves are in pairs opposite each other. They're on long petioles and they're round to kidney shaped with a rounded toothed margin. Uh, the leaves are typically medium to dark green, uh, but new growth can be purplish. Flowers are pink to purple, funnel shaped, and they appear early in the spring to June. Ground ivy spreads by seed and by root pieces. Uh, creeps along the ground on square stems that can root at the nodes. Uh, this weed is difficult to control. Small patches can be pulled easily by hand, uh, but seed in the soil will bring new growth. The home remedy, uh, mule team borax, is not recommended uh, and can be ineffective or so effective that nothing will grow because the soil has been damaged. Um, the use of a registered post-emergent herbicide 
labeled for ground ivy is recommended. Um, but certainly plan on both spring and fall applications as this weed is persistent. Buckhorn plantain is a cool season perennial uh, that tolerates compaction, low fertility, dry soils, uh, and low mowing heights. Simply mowing higher can reduce populations by shading this weed. It forms a rosette. Uh, with narrow leaves that have prominent parallel veins. Uh, the leaves are dark green with sharp tips and are sometimes twisted and curled. The flowers are tightly clustered at the end of a long stalk. They're white and delicate, and they open one ring at a time from the bottom to the top, turning brown as they fade. The seed head is bullet-shaped. Reproduction is by seed. Broadleaf plantain, uh, it's a related species. Uh, this cool season perennial has broad oval shaped leaves. The petioles can be reddish or purplish. Uh, like buckthorn or buckhorn, uh, I have trouble saying that. Like buckhorn, um, it forms a rosette and it has parallel veins. The flowers are small, white to pink, and are born in dense clusters at the upper ends of the stalks. Uh, they appear like fingers or rat tails. Flowering occurs May to September uh, for both types of plantains. Um, and this weed can be found where buckhorn grows, but it also has really good shade tolerance. Dandelion, that's uh, a cool season perennial aster. Uh, it flowers heavily in the spring, but can continue to flower into the fall. Um, flowers can be found during mild temperatures in winter even. Reproduction is by seed uh, and by broken taproot pieces. Uh, it has a long, sturdy taproot. Dandelion can occur in landscapes and most lawns, but especially in thin turf. Uh, it forms a rosette of narrow, deeply lobed, pointed leaves. Uh, the lobes point uh, towards the, the leaf base. Uh, and sometimes purpling of the stems can occur with cooler temperatures. The flowers are yellow, born singly on hollow, smooth stalks. Uh, the flowers develop into grayish white puffballs, and the seeds are dispersed by wind. Uh, when cut, the leaves, stalks, and taproot will exude a milky juice. White clover, uh, it's a cool season perennial. It forms patches in wet springs. It reproduces by seed and creeping stolons that root at the nodes. Uh, it does well in low nitrogen fertility settings as it's a legume and it has the ability to grow with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. White clover has trifoliate leaves, meaning each leaf is comprised of three leaflets. Uh, these are unstalked, oval, and dark green. And each has a white crescent or V-shaped mark. Each leaf is on a long petiole. Flowers are ball shaped and typically white, but can be pinkish. They appear May through September. Yellow wood sorrel or oxalis also has three leaflets, but each leaflet is heart shaped. Uh, they are unstalked. It often grows erect and bushy up to 20 inches tall. The leaves are bright yellow green usually, um, but can also be purple depending on growing conditions. Uh, the flowers are yellow with five petals and appear May through September. Um, seeds can eject from the capsules as far as 13 feet. Um, this perennial spreads by seed and short rhizomes but can act as a summer annual. 
uh, most commonly in Illinois, it lives as an annual. Now, weed ID can be tricky, uh, so it's great to have resources. Uh, I recommend these weed ID books, and I'm a little partial to this first one, uh, Identifying Weeds in Midwestern Turf and Landscapes. Uh, this pocket-sized guide features 37 of the most common species you'll encounter. Uh, short descriptions are given along uh, with um, look-alike species. And the two are side by side with notes on how they differ. Uh, this book is available at the Pubs Plus website. Identifying turf and weedy grasses of the Northern United States uh, focuses on grasses only, and it too is pocket sized. This one features many close-up photos uh, there of the collar region, including the ligule. And it too is available at the Pubs Plus uh, website. Now, just a reminder um, that uh, you can view any past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening Series uh, on YouTube. Uh, so, so do check those out. And um, this one will be um, posted there as well. And please, if you would, uh, take a brief survey uh, by either scanning the code or following the link. And um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, thanks again for participating. And I will go ahead, let's see. I'm gonna turn on my camera. Awesome. Maybe Thank there you so I much, am. Michelle. Hi. Sure, hello. <laughs> I can help you out with the um with the questions and I'll stop the oh, recording. Good.